This last, uh, this past week uh, in the McLean household, uh, we, we suffered a, a big loss. Uh, we caved to the outside pressure. And, and I'm quite ashamed of this, uh, but we turned on our heat uh, this past week. Um, it's like a game. I know, I know. It's like a game for me to see how long we can go without turning the heat on. Uh, use all the tricks that I know. If you know more tricks, please share them with me. Uh, but the tricks that I know, shower with the door wide open, turn the fan off. I don't want that heat uh, escaping from the house. Uh, so I'll get Ezra running in the bathroom. And, and it's worth it, losing my peace of mind. If, if we're keeping the house, if we're keeping the heat from the shower, after we're done using the oven, we, we leave it wide open. Uh, we start to bundle up. The sweatshirts will come on at our house. If you know any other tricks and to keep the heat in the house, give them to me. I, I, I am interested in that sort of thing. Uh, but I caved as uh, I didn't want Ezra or Ayla getting cold. Kids, uh, they make us do the craziest things like turning our heat on too early. Has anybody withstood the pressure from the outside world and not turned on your heat yet this fall? Bravo, bravo, I am happy for you guys. But I put my uh, focus on uh, things like this because naturally, I'm a pretty uh, frugal guy. I get satisfaction out of saving money, which is really not a bad thing uh, when you go into the ministry. Uh, but this past weekend, uh, Jamie uh, met her sister in Kentucky, and she took Ayla with her. And so it was a boys' weekend. Ezra and I, we, we hung out Friday and Saturday. Um, and so what do you do on a boys' weekend? Uh, you take your son uh, to your, uh, one of your favorite fast food restaurants, and that's McDonald's. I love McDonald's. And some people are like, they're giving me the eyes right now. But I love uh, McDonald's, not necessarily because they have the best service or the best food, but I love McDonald's because I can get a great deal at McDonald's. Uh, I get a $3 bundle at McDonald's, and the $3 bundle, it comes with a double cheeseburger and a small fry, and I also have the app on my phone, and uh, I get a, la a free large fry with the purchase of $2 or more. So it takes a decent bit to feed me, but I can feed myself for $3 at McDonald's with a double cheeseburger, a small fry, and a large fry, when typically a large fry would cost around $3 by itself. That's a pretty good deal, uh, if you ask me. Uh, and I, I've made this order a number. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I've made that order a number of times. I was taking uh, my order this past weekend. The guy taking my order said, wow, that's a good deal. I was like... Yes, yes, thank you. Let me tell you, it should not have, but, but that really uh, made my night. Uh, the guy at McDonald's taking my order, recognizing that, hey, because I'm sure he's seen all sorts of orders, but he recognized that, you man, you have got a good deal. I do not, I do not, no, uh, maybe I need to invest, I don't know. Uh, but it's the same uh, frugal part of me that can at times hoard uh, onto things as well. In our whole household, Jamie is typically the purger, and I am typically the hoarder. I'm sure many of you guys ha have a similar setup where maybe one partner is the purger, or we need to get rid of this, 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 and this, and another one of you, uh, the, the other partner might be, no, we, we, we need to keep this, this, and this. Uh, maybe it works out in a healthy uh, balance. But uh, one area where this definitely holds true in our household is clothes. Uh, I have a lot of of clothes. And let me tell you, it is not because I shop for clothes. I've not bought uh, clothes for myself outside of my birthday and Christmas in years. The last two times I can think of going through my head uh, was when I first got here, I needed some dress pants, so I bought some dress pants. It wasn't even my birthday or anything. Uh, and then on our honeymoon, uh, I got a splurge and bought a couple of shirts. But outside of that, outside of my birthday, and when I first got here in the honeymoon, not really bought clothes for myself uh, at all. Um, but when I do get my hands on clothes, I clench that sucker with white knuckles. I, I am a frugal guy, and I do not want to have to buy more clothes. I even have a, a handful of, in case I pack on the pounds, uh, clothes. <laughs> Uh, when I was in college, uh, I got a ton of hand-me-down clothes uh, from not really a big dude, but he's bigger uh, than me. And nearly half my clothes are hand-me-downs. Um, and my frugality has led me to come attached to my clothes. Jamie has tried on multiple occasions for me to get rid of some clothes. I simply have a lot more than I need. 
And when she would do that, I would get rid of maybe two, three shirts. And I'd hear about it afterwards. Um, uh, but <laughs> does anybody else struggle with this? Raise your hand if you struggle with this. Be honest with me. I, I, see, uh, I see more and more hands raising. Yeah, uh, I struggle with that. Um, and, and maybe it's because you're frugal and, and you don't want to have to spend more money on more clothes. Or maybe you just love shopping and you want to accumulate all, all these different sort of clothes. If you can at all relate, you need to listen up. Because this changed uh, for me uh, this past week as I was studying this week's topic of how to ruthlessly eliminate hurry. As I was studying uh, this topic for this week, I got rid of two full big uh, trash bags of clothes uh, this past week. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and that would not have been the case uh, before this. Uh, but our, our topic uh, for today is simplicity. It's a, a, a very similar concept to uh, what many modern thinkers uh, term minimalism. And I like this definition of simplicity found in the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And if you have uh, that definition up there, Ben, uh, you guys can all read that as well. The definition of simplicity reads, the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of everything that distracts us from them. So basically, simplicity boils down to two things. Number one is promoting things that we value, and it is removing the distractions to what we value. And oftentimes, we, we, we think of big spenders having a, lots of issues uh, with this concept of simplicity. And that is absolutely true. B big spenders, people who love to shop, they, they struggle uh, with this concept. On the other hand, what we often overlook is my frugality uh, led me uh, to put my focus on my clothes. And when my focus is on my clothes, do you know what my focus is not on? It is not on God. So I know we have a, a lot of, of frugal, people, frugal people here. Uh, far, farming communities are generally more frugal uh, than uh, people in uh, the city. Uh, but your frugality can lead to issues uh, with this concept of simplicity as well. This issue isn't whether we are frugal or not. The problem that we run into is materialism. No matter how you spend your finances, you can run into this issue of materialism. As materialism has sped up our society to a crazy, crazy pace. The drive to possess more and more is an engine for our hurry. In the Nixon era, uh, about 50 uh, years ago, uh, they thought that today we would be working around three to four hours in the morning and spend the rest of the day relaxing uh, due to our technological advancements. Well, instead, today in the year uh, 2022, we are actually working more than we used to, as more work equals more money, and more money equals more things. We, we love things in Western civilization. We, we are highly driven by the idea of materialism, that we want to possess more and more and more and more things in our lives. And we become so attached to these things in our lives that we get our meaning in life sometimes from the things that we consume and own. And materialism, the focus on things, can wreak havoc on us, driving us to hurry as we got to work more, we, we got to pile our schedule with more and more and more, and that leads to us putting our focus off of God. And so the antidote of materialism is simplicity. Simplicity. Interestingly enough, arguably the best sermon in all of history takes a fairly deep dive into this idea of materialism versus simplicity. And that sermon is the Sermon on the Mount given by Jesus himself. A big chunk of his sermon was spent dealing with this struggle. And so if you have your Bibles uh, with you this morning, you can open up to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, where, where Jesus, uh, he uh, amassed a large crowd that the crowd wanted to hear what he had to say as he was uh, starting to get a little bit of a name for himself. He, he was healing people, uh, and, and people wanted in on the action. And so 
as he uh, accumulated this large crowd, he gathered at at a mount, uh, and he delivered a phenomenal sermon in which uh, Matthew, uh, one of his disciples, recorded for us in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. If you have never read through the Sermon on the Mount, you've got to do that today. First thing you do when you go home is read through the Sermon on the Mount. In my eyes, the, the greatest sermon ever preached in all of history. And so in the midst of this sermon that, that Jesus is giving uh, to these people, he covers a handful of topics. But in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19, Jesus says to this large crowd, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus says, do, do not lay up treasures on earth. In other words, do not put your value in the things of the earth. Instead, we should put our treasure, instead we should put the things that we value in, in heaven. That, that, those are the things that we should value in our life. And we ask, well, well what or who is in heaven? And the obvious answer is God. God is in heaven. And so we have got to highly value God in our lives. And seated at the right hand of God in heaven is his son, Jesus, our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we have got to highly value Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, they talk about time and time and time again, the kingdom of heaven. As there is a kingdom being prepared for you and I that's from heaven. It's going to send from heaven to earth. That, that's, that's why Matthew describes it as the kingdom of heaven. It's coming from heaven to earth. And so we've got to highly value this idea of the kingdom of heaven as well. And if we are wise, we will build our happiness uh, and joy on things which we cannot lose. Things which are independent of the chances and the changes of this life. The car that, that, that you drove to church this morning, I'm guessing you drove a car, that, that is subject uh, to, to be wrecked. Uh, that, that is subject to be taken away from you. The, the house that you dwell in, that, that is subject, and, and the, you ask the, the Florida residents, that is subject to be taken away just like that. The, the, the gadgets that we possess, the clothes that, that we possess, everything, all the possessions that we have here on earth, they can vanish just like that. And how foolish is it to put our value and joy in things that can vanish at the snap of a finger? That is outright foolish. When on the other hand, we can put our value in things in which no thief can steal, no rust can destroy, no moth can destroy. It is eternal. It is everlasting. God, G Jesus, who has been giving everlasting life now, and the coming kingdom of God, the, the ultimate hope that has no end. This is where our hope, this is where our value needs to lie, not on the treasures here on earth. For that is where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So don't be foolish about that. The rest of society, they are very, very foolish in putting their, 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 their treasure, their value in the things that they possess. Even people, you know, even your spouse, your children, your parents, we, we all have experienced death of loved ones. It can be gone just in the snap of fingers. And so ultimately, put your value of the things of the treasures in heaven. And that's God, that's his precious son, Jesus. That's the kingdom that's being prepared for you and I. And so Jesus continues, he says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where you place your value in life, there your heart will also lie. Uh, Jews back in the day, they, they, they kind of perceived the heart in, in a slightly uh, different manner than, than we do today in the 21st uh, century. Uh, the heart uh, was typically perceived as the seat of intelligence and will. So, so similar to what we view of the mind, you, you know, our, intelli uh, our intelligence, our will. And so Jesus' teaching reflects this view. He says people's choices and actions 
are shaped by the things that they cherish most. And so our schedule, our budget, our relationships, our resources are all shaped by what we value most. And so if your house and your car are the things that you value most, your schedule is going to reflect that in your budget and your resources and your relationships. If your family is a thing that you value the most, then your schedule, your budget, your resources and relationships are going to reflect that. And if God is a thing that you value most, then your schedule, budget, relationships, and resources, they are all going to be shaped by that desire to grow closer to God. And so Jesus says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And so Jesus kind of compares uh, the eye uh, sort of serves as a window for us and that it lets light into our lives. And if we have clear vision, then our bodies may be full of the light. On the other hand, if if our vision is clouded by jealousy and greed and selfishness, then our lives will be full of darkness. And so here's the clincher in in verse 24. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Your purpose in life cannot be to attain more money while at the same time, your purpose in life to be to serve God. This isn't like a command. This this isn't Jesus saying, thou shalt not serve God and money at the same time. He's not commanding us. No, Jesus is just stating a fact of life that it is impossible You cannot serve both God and money. It it cannot be done. For either you'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And so when we're so wrapped into the things, into the material things of this world, and that's what drives us on a daily basis, then at the same time, we cannot serve God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that's a place that we do not want to to be in. And so on top of this teaching, you know, we, we, we see the stark contrast uh, but between storing our treasure in heaven versus the things of this world. Jesus, he, he kind of uh, shifts gear uh, slightly, but, but it's all along uh, the same lines. Uh, I'll read uh, a fairly uh, big chunk here uh, for the sake of time. But in, in uh, verse 25, Jesus, he, he's talking uh, about a similar topic. And he says, therefore, I tell you, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the year. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And so Jesus, as he is delivering the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a large gathering there, there's a large crowd, it's very likely that the majority of people present to hear Jesus speaking was not very well off. These are likely poor people, people who would likely get anxious about the food that they would drink, the water that they drink, and the clothes on their back. And I find that interesting as well and how he talks about uh, the, the, the treasures here on earth and talking to a group of people who probably don't have a whole lot of treasures uh, here on earth. But basically here in, in this big chunk, um, Jesus says, don't worry about the material things of this world. 
God knows that we need food. God knows that we need water and clothes. God provides uh, for the birds of the air. God provides for the grass. How much more will he provide for you? So don't worry about that. Don't worry about the material things in this world. And so if we aren't to worry, if we aren't to put our focus on the material things of the world, what are we to put our focus on? That's a, that's, that's a very good question. And thank goodness Jesus answers that for us. He says, but, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't be anxious about tomorrow and the things uh, of this earth. For tomorrow, it has enough worries of its own. Instead, we've got to be focusing on it. Instead, we've got to be seeking God's kingdom first and foremost. That's where our treasure and focus needs to lie. Our purpose in life needs to be to enter God's coming kingdom and bring in as many people as possible with us. If that's not what drives you on a day in and day out basis, something needs to change and it needs to change yesterday. We have to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else comes after this. You cannot serve both God and money. So today, 21st century, we need to simplify our lives around God, around Jesus, and the kingdom of God. Ben, can you pull up uh, the definition of simplicity again? Definition of simplicity, uh, according to this book, which I really like, uh, the, the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of everything that distracts us from them. If you're someone who takes notes, or even if you don't typically take notes, I highly encourage you uh, to jot uh, this quote here down. And according to the teachings of Jesus, the thing that we should seek first is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is what we shall most value in our lives. And so if we're seeking to live a simple life, then our life should be all about promoting the kingdom of God. As that is what we shall value first and foremost, according to the words of Jesus, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so we are intentionally promoting the kingdom. And at the same time, we need to remove everything that distracts us from the kingdom. That is the definition of simplicity for Christians. Promote the intentional promotion of the kingdom and the removal of everything that distracts us from the kingdom. And so we need to promote the kingdom in our lives. Our budget needs to promote the kingdom. The, 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 the resources, the, the monetary resources that God has blessed us with, they need to promote the kingdom of God. Our time, our schedule, they need to be promoting the kingdom of God. The resources outside of our time and money, they, they need to be used for the kingdom of God and promoting the kingdom of God. Our relationships need to be used to promote the coming kingdom of God. And at, and at the same exact time, we need to remove everything that distracts us from the kingdom. That is the whole idea of simplicity in the perspective of a Christian. The goal in simplicity isn't just to declutter your closet and garage and to get rid of two garbage uh, bags full of clothes. No, 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 no. The, the grand scheme, the grand purpose in simplicity is to declutter your entire life so that you are intentionally promoting the kingdom of God. We've we got to declutter everything that distracts us from God's kingdom. You know, people, we, we, we live with an inextinguishable uh, discontent. You know, the typical person, they want more, and they want more, and they want more, and they want more. 
I remember, uh, I'll confess with you guys here, I remember uh, when we uh, were living in our apartment, my, my thought was, oh, if we just had a house, that, that would be great. Now we're in a house, and uh, sometimes I, I think to myself, oh, if we just had a backyard patio, if we just had a hot tub, if we just had whatever, we will never be content. We will never be content with the things of the world. We, we have this inextinguishable discontent. It's what Solomon uh, describes in Ecclesiastes as the chasing after the wind. We're striving and we're striving and we're striving after these things. And the more we get, all that leads is to us wanting more and more. He wrote that nine times uh, in his short book. People are constantly striving after things that will rot in the end. And we have to daily remind ourselves that the only thing that will extinguish our constant state of discontent is an ever-growing relationship with God. God is the only one who can fill the everlasting craving that dwells within us. And so when we implement this idea of simplicity, of putting our focus solely on God and eliminating all of the distractions around us, that will calm our lives down as we get rid of the, the things that distract us from God and from his coming kingdom. And we'll have a sense of satisfaction in the midst of a country and a world full of people who are dissatisfied. You can have that exact thing that people are craving. And it's only made possible by putting your focus on God first and foremost. He is the only one able to fill that huge hole in our hearts. And so I encourage you guys to think about all the things that distract us from God's coming kingdom. And once you have identified these things, then hang them on the cross, put them to death, exterminate them from your life. One of the biggest things that can distract us from God's coming kingdom is sin itself. There's only one person in all of history that completely stayed away from sin. We know that's Jesus himself, Jesus the Messiah, born of the Virgin Mary. He was able to withstand the, the temptations of sin his entire life. Well, it was all part of God's plan from the beginning to sacrifice his perfect son, Jesus, to give us the tools to eradicate sin from our life as well. So through the sacrifice on the cross, we have been given these tools of justification. We've been made right in the eyes of God. We've been redeemed. We've been bought with the price. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart. We have newness of life. We are adopted children of God. We have been given the tools to live a simple life, to focus on God first and foremost, and to eradicate the distractions that distract us from God. And so today, we, we, we recognize uh, the, the price that was paid to make that possible for both you and I, to live a simple life, a life in which we seek God's kingdom first and foremost. It's all made possible through what this bread and cup represent. So if you take out these emblems, you open the top, this bread represents the body of Jesus being broken for you and I. Let's go ahead and pray over the bread. Father, I just, I thank you for laying your son Jesus down for us. I thank you for the ultimate price that was paid on behalf of each and every one of us here this morning, Father. Father, I pray that we use the sacrifice. I pray that we use it to give you glory and give you honor. And so we just thank you for the greatest gift of love in all of history. It's in Jesus' precious and holy, holy name that we pray. Amen. Partake together.
Before we partake of the cup together, I want you all to just spend a minute or two thinking about the things in your life that distract you from seeking God's kingdom first and foremost. And I encourage you to nail those things to the cross. It's exactly what they did to our Savior. Spend a couple of minutes reflecting on the sacrifice and giving up those distractions to God. like for you, whether that be your clothes, whether that be your phone, whether that be a game, whether that be a certain relationship, I don't know, but I'm guessing there's something that you have in your life right now that distracts you from God's coming kingdom. And it's my plea that you offer it up to God as he offered up his son for you. It's the least that we can do for God and his son, Jesus Christ. So let's together, as a family, as a body of believers who've been set free, partake of the blood of Jesus. Father, we love you. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. And Father, I pray that our schedules, I pray that our budget, our resources, our relationships reflect our desire to seek you first and foremost. I pray that we offer it all up to you. So we love you. We thank you for the promise of your coming kingdom. And I pray that that is where our treasure lies. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.